Hello and good evening. It's 8 p.m. UK time, so it is time to start our next IVF webinar tonight as we have yet another topic. And this time we are, well, connecting with Portugal. So hi, Dr. Vladimir, how are you feeling tonight? Hi, Caroline. I'm fine. Thank you. Happy Very happy to, to be here again. Very happy that you have, uh, well, uh, joined us again, as this is uh, our second webinar with you. So glad to see you as well right here. Please let us know, everyone, that you can hear us so we can make sure all is working. Um, but first, let me just also remind everyone that uh, we are here every single day just to support you throughout your um waiting uh, for the actual treatment to be able to uh, to start to to continue so we are that's why stronger together initiative has been created uh, and this has been also possible thanks to our ambassadors and partners as always i want to definitely thank them for their support you can see all of them right here as well and uh, thank you so much for confirming that you can hear me and tonight as i've mentioned we have another interesting topic to discuss and this is non-anonymous egg sperm and embryo donation in Portugal and with us tonight is Dr. Vladimir um Vladimir oh, sorry Silva who is an embryologist CEO and founder and IVF lab director at Ferti Centro and Procrear uh, clinics in Portugal it's good to have you back and uh, well I will just simply say that we will start with the presentation and afterwards it will be time for your questions you know what to do just simply type in the questions so that Dr. Vladimir can answer them for you and I'm sure he will be happy to do so so um, I guess we can start Dr. Vladimir are you re ready? Yes, I am Caroline just to make sure uh, is my presentation in full screen right now? It's okay. It's uh, yes. It's going to look like this, okay? But I okay. believe patients, if you, uh, our patients are able to see it. So if just to make sure, if you could let us know. But I believe yeah. everything is working just fine. Okay, wonderful. So Thank Caroline, you. once again, uh, many thanks for uh, having me here. It's always a pleasure to um, to participate in this kind of events, uh, and it's uh, obviously also a pleasure to talk to patients and uh, other persons about the situation in Portugal. Um, um, this time we're talking about our IVF legislation. Uh, we're very proud of it because uh, we, ha I think, we have one of the most progressive and um, and patient-friendly legislation in IVF uh, in whole Europe right now. Um, and so I will tell you a little bit about the story, about how things work in here. And then um, obviously uh, a few details. Uh, I will share a few thoughts on this issue as well. And so let's take it from here. So the, uh, the first thing that I would like to tell is that uh, here in Portugal, we had, like many other countries, uh, a legislation where donors were anonymous. And uh, we were good, okay? We were happy with our legislation. We were doing treatments, every, everything was working. We had donors and um, I mean, we were happy. And then from a moment to the other, uh, in a totally unexpected way, the Constitutional Court, the Portuguese Constitutional Court, which is the highest uh, court in the country, uh, suddenly changed the law. It was on the 24th of April, 2018, and it was sort of an accident. The, the anonymity legislation was dragged by an evaluation on the surrogacy law, which has nothing to do with this, uh, but um, by accident, some members of the parliament also pled uh, to the Constitutional Court against the anonymity uh, of the donors and the same court that nine years before had ruled in favor of the anonymity of the donors then changed his mind and decided that donors should no longer be anonymous. Since this was the highest uh, court in the country, there's no appeal. And so from a second to the other, it was on the 24th of April, 2018, we simply lost all donors. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I, I, I remember exactly where I was when I received that new, that information, because we just, everybody was completely surprised. No one saw this coming. 
Um, and well, we, there were treatments that were being done uh, as we uh, uh, on that very next day, and we were not able to conclude those treatments because donors were not were anonymous, and they have agreed to be to donate under anonymity, and so we couldn't use their cells because from a moment to the other, they were not no longer anonymous, and not only that, but anonymous donors were no longer authorized uh, in Portugal. So we had to start working, and this is what we do. Uh, in the first two weeks of this legislation, we called uh, more than 600 persons. We, we were calling all of our donors, asking them whether they accept to donate under non-anonymity uh, conditions. Um, and we were explaining them the law. We were obviously trying to talk, them, talk to them about the process. It was very complicated, either from a psychological point of, point of view. We had to do a lot of counseling to the donors. Uh, but And so we spent hours and hours and hours at the phone, everybody at the clinic, nurses, embryologists, doctors, uh, psychologists, everybody was talking on the phone uh, with donors. So in order to explain how things were, uh, in order to, to ask them whether they would ag still agree to still donate and uh, under the new the new legislation and we had this very nice surprise because at our clinic at least at Ferti Centro 97% of our registered egg donors accepted to be non-anonymous and 70% of our sperm donors also accepted to be non-anonymous and so um Obviously, those were the donors who were, were already in the process, but we had to start campaigning because uh, we were afraid that what happened in other countries also happened in Portugal. We saw that in the UK, when the, the non-anonymity legislation uh, was put in place, the number of donors uh, had um, dropped very, very suddenly. And so we started, there were official campaigns from public uh, IVF centers, the Portuguese Society for Reproductive Medicine and, some, uh, and the Patient Association. They also started campaign for donation all of the IV, of the private IVF centers also did their own uh, campaigns. And so uh, we had the most uh, incredible surprise uh, that donations picked. We've never had this many donors. So uh, it was a complete unexpected effect totally counterintuitive um, and so and even maybe paradoxical so when we changed from anonymity into non-anonymous donation uh, we ended up having uh, more donors than ever before uh, right now for example at 30 central we have more than 2000 registered egg donors uh, we have hundreds uh, of sperm donors all of them non-anonymous obviously they're not all available to donate uh, all the time but uh, there's absolutely no shortage of donors in, in the private sector and so in portugal we've uh, we've made the transition from a model where donors were anonymous and we didn't have this many donors to a model uh, where donors are non-anonymous and there are lots of donors, which I believe is a very unique situation uh, in Europe. Um, and so uh, we even established a private egg and sperm bank. We are allowed to send cells to other countries. We were the first uh, egg and sperm bank in the country to, to work like that. Um, and so we are um, very happy with this situation uh, of our current legislation. Uh, and so, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, I believe, well, uh, I have to say, because in the when initially uh, I was against this, because I thought that uh, we would lose all donors. Um, uh, when I saw it in practice, and especially when I started talking to patients, uh, to, to the patients that were undergoing the process, um, I changed my mind and obviously I, reg I regret everything I said back then because I was uh, a fierce defensor of anonymous donations. 
and now I'm I completely changed my mind because by talking to donors, by talking to patients, by seeing how things work in the field, it is completely different. Not only there's no shortage of donors, but I think this current legislation of ours it is, is a lot more ethical and a lot more respected, respectful over the human rights. Um, and so just to tell you a little bit about our legislation, which I believe is one of the most progressive and patient-friendly in Europe, uh, children born from donations have the right of access to the identity of their donors at the age of 18. Uh, the access to this ID is granted and guaranteed by the Portuguese state, which means that even if a clinic closes, the national IVF authority uh, will have the possibility of giving the, the, the person born from the donation the information on the identity of his or her donors. Uh, this information about donors is kept for 75 years. This is very important in terms of traceability. This also means that if, let's say, someone at the age of 18 uh, doesn't um, necessarily want to meet or have access to the information of their donor, they don't have to decide on that moment. So they can change their mind at the age of 30 or at the age of 40 because the information would still be av available. Um, also, um, the number of donations per donor is, a, is very limited. Uh, for example, egg donors can donate four times through her lifetime. It is controlled because we have to register everything in the database of the National IVF Authority, and it's very transparent because uh, it can't be more transparent than disclosing the donor's ID. Also, uh, when we're dealing with non-anonymous donors, any potential fraud or intent of donating more than the, the limited number of times will be very easily found. So uh, our system doesn't uh, permit that uh, someone is donating sperm in 10 different IVF centers um, because at the end of the day, there's a limit on the number of donations and there's a central registry uh, for all of that. So we know that the limit on egg donations uh, and the limit on sperm donations, once it is achieved, that donor gets blocked and it can, and he or she cannot be used anywhere. Uh, as I said, egg donors can donate four times in her lifetime, um, separated by three months, uh, while sperm donors can originate, uh, can donate up to eight families, can have children in eight different families. Uh, also, the process of donor compensation is very transparent in Portugal. It is fixed by law. Uh, it's currently uh, on 878 euros for egg donors and 44 euros for every sperm collection. It is the same for our public and private centers. We can only pay by bank transfer or check. We cannot pay in cash. Donors sign a receipt. So again, everything is very transparent and very traceable. And there are no questions about this. We can't pay more. We can't pay less. It's fixed by law. Uh, it is as simple as that. Um, again, um, and so moving a little bit about the importance of anonymity and uh, the Portuguese legislation, uh, and why did I change my mind about it? Uh, in fact, this is about uh, uh, a person. So this is about the human right, because what, getting to know your origin is something that uh, everybody wants and so uh, and it is also something that you can't help not nowadays and certainly not in the future so nowadays we have websites like uh, my heritage or 23andme where you just can send a swap uh, from your oropharyngeal mucosa and then uh, you'll get an information on your genetic profile and on and whether you have cousins or um, any related person registered in the database it is very cheap it is very easy. You can order a kit from the internet uh, you can, and then you'll get all of that information. There are even associations like, for example, this association in France. They have already revealed 37 sper donors, especially sperm donors, and found 186 siblings. It's an association called PMA Non Anonyme. So, um, 
I mean, so it is impossible because uh, the identity of the donor, it's, uh, it's always possible to find uh, by, the, by the using uh, uh, of generic testing. And so, uh, like this article says, it, it was published in Human Reproduction, which is a scientific publication from the European Society of Reproductive, uh, of uh, Human Reproduction and Embryology. Um, they said, in, in, in practical terms, it shows that there's no such thing as an anonymous donor. What we have, a, a, because that information about the donor is always possible to find. If you do, uh, it's like sending a, a message in a bottle into the ocean, but it's very likely that that bottle comes back or, or finds its destination because uh, nowadays with uh, with this huge databases of genetic information growing bigger every day uh, it's very easy to find uh, your origin so it's pointless to try to hide that information it's also pointless to make uh, donors uh, and their families pass through that process of having someone finding their origins. For example, in this, uh, this is a graphic that I found in the website of DNA Non Anonym, um, where you can see the number uh, of people uh, whose genetic information is already in the database. And here you will see that, for example, uh, one of the databases, Ancestry DNA, has already reached 15 million people. Uh, My Heritage, for instance, is uh, at 2.5 million. A G G D match, it's around 10 million. So there is this is a lot of information. So it's very easy. So uh, like you see another statistics from My Heritage, 95 million users, 3.9 billion family tree profiles. To 12.4 billion historical records. So it is virtually impossible to keep uh, the, the identity of the donor secret. Um, so, um, uh, and, and in fact, there's, uh, there's, we don't even need the donor to register himself in these databases. Uh, if you can find a couple of donors' cousins, uh, that should be, that sometimes that's enough to, to find the donor because uh, you contact these persons, they are your relatives, somehow you start talking and then you end up very easily uh, because we are living the era of social networks. Well, well, all the information is available and very easily accessible. And so um, uh, by doing this, uh, we can only, we can obviously find out who our donors are. And uh, by, by, by keeping the law requiring anonymous donations, we are, uh, we are having, we are taking risks. For example, there's this case that was very famous in the Netherlands where uh, a single sperm donor has originated uh, 106 kids and uh, counting because he has donated in many places. Uh, so um, we, with anonymous donations, we lose control over the process. Things would be different if, for example, this gentleman would be aware that uh, he would be found uh, because donors were not anonymous. If there was somebody controlling the number of donations, obviously he could donate in different countries, but it would be more difficult. So. Um, when we when we open the door to non anonymous uh, donations, we are also closing the door to this kind of situations, which are uh, not good. Obviously, obviously, we want people to donate sperm to donate eggs, but we don't want a single donor to donate uh, to originate one hundred and six kids. Uh, um, and so um, there are other ways uh, for donors to be found. We can use Y chromosome studies, for example, take this study from the, univer the, the University of Leicester, where the, a group of geneticists found that um, uh, uh, millions and millions of modern Asian men are descended from 11 very powerful dynastic leaders who lived up to uh, 4,000 years ago, including uh, Genghis Khan. So 
uh, maybe uh, I'm also a descendant of Genghis Khan, I don't know, but uh, it is not difficult. You see, genetics, uh, either through the Y chromosome, either through the X chromosome with mitochondrial DNA studies, allows us to find our origins these days. So uh, it is very easy to see if someone is related to another person, and then if you send uh, if you allow your information to be registered in one of these databases, it's almost impossible that uh, you don't find your anonymous donor. And so that could be a problem. Uh, uh, also, I forgot to mention, there are even uh, specialized services on this. Uh, in the Netherlands, there is this donor detective service. Uh, in the USA, DNA detectives. In Canada, Carrefour ADN. So there are um, lots of ways to find the identity of the donor. So uh, it's pointless to, to resource to anonymous donors. Uh, the only thing that we're doing while using an anonymous donor is losing control over the process. Uh, and in fact, um, because uh, if you see, uh, if you think about it, and, and there's also this declaration from, from the European Parliament uh, about the... Um, about the rights uh, of sperm and egg donors, um, where it says very clearly that international and European human rights law is moved towards recognitions of a right to know one's origins. So uh, the, the Committee on Social Affairs, Health and Sustainable Development believes that anonymity should be waived for all future gam gamete donations. Obviously, that this has to be balanced with the culture of uh, in every country. Uh, obviously, that this law shouldn't be applic uh, applicated retrospectively. That would be uh, in Portugal. Um, that possibility was put, and then the parliament legislated against it. Uh, and so, only uh, the donors that agreed to be non-anonymous uh, are non-anonymous. In fact. Um, and so um, uh, the, uh, it is uh, where we are right now. So there is some pressure from the authorities, from even the European Court of Human Rights uh, towards uh, having non-anonymous donations because it is a human right. And so, um, uh, like I was saying, um, getting to know the identity of a donor is something that we cannot help and not nowadays, certainly not in the future. And so there are two options. We can get, we can provide our uh, the kids that are born from donations uh, the access of to the identity of their donors in a very in a controlled and well counselled way, uh, where uh, the state gives access to that information, where donors uh, agree to. To, to donate under those circumstances, knowing that in the future someone um, might knock on his door and say, I was born from your sperm or from your eggs, or we can do it in an uncontrolled way where we use the so-called anonymous donors. And then uh, a few years later, those donors who don't want to be found, who didn't, weren't even aware that it was possible uh, for them to be found, uh, who don't expect to be found, uh, are discovered and um, that could have an impact on their personal life. And obviously even for the child, you don't want to meet your sperm donor and be someone and found out that someone uh, is very upset with that fact because he donated under anonymous conditions. So it's different when you're looking for a sperm or a, an egg donor and you know that that person while donating knew that he or she could be contacted or um, his identity would be revealed to the to the child um, it's completely different than what happens uh, when that comes as a surprise as something that you don't control or uh, at least it, it can also be very frustrating because uh, some of the donors are in fact impossible to be found 
and so uh, some children born from donation can do can hire a dna detective can send their dna to a lot of databases all over the world and still might have not finding their donors they can be very frustrated about it because it's part of their right uh, uh, of their personality and so um there is uh, no reason today to keep doing anonymous donations it is it is something it is a right of the children that aren't yet born it's something that we cannot help i mean if we even if we were if we are strong believers that donors should remain anonymous um it's something that we cannot help because donors will not be anonymous it's impossible with the way that technology is progressing right now so we are really choosing uh, between giving that information in a controlled or an uncontrolled way okay um, and so uh, this is why as i was saying in the beginning i believe the portuguese legislation is the best solution because no donors are surprised by an expected uh, an expected genital offspring knocking on their doors uh, every family controls how and when the information is disclosed so we don't want uh, your kids to find this by accident to have someone calling them and saying i'm your cousin uh, without them knowing that they were born from a sperm or an egg donations uh, in Portugal, with our system and the very transparent way, the official, the commitment, the commitment of the official authorities, not only the the official, the the Portuguese IVF authority, the patients associations, the public hospitals, and so um, uh, donation is seen like a very good thing, a good thing, something that you should be proud of doing. So uh, we don't have any problem with the availability of donors in private centers only in public centers but this is uh, the causes are not the lack of donors available to donate it's more about um, financing uh, issues but so we don't have waiting lists our treatments are affordable because Portugal is not a very expensive country um, and so um, um, uh, and so and also we have a controlled number of donations obviously all uh, other countries you can have a controlled number of donations without disclosing the identity of the donor but still it is easier to do it when the donor knows uh, that he will his identity will would be revealed so um again uh, it is uh, also so there's not only what's written in the law but also uh, the the effect uh, of this of changing the mind of person someone who like that guy from the netherlands who wants to donate and have 100 kids um will think twice because uh, he knows that within a few years uh, from that moment he will that will could backfire on him so uh, i mean uh, it's uh, it's always preferable to have more control over this than to leave this to the anonymity and so uh, it is important to have transparency in the donor compensation process also the number of donations and where uh, uh, and it is also extremely important that that the access of to the origins should be granted by the state and not by a private entity and it is important to keep the this information for a very long time like it is re legally required here in Portugal and so um, the, this was my message I see that there are a lot of comments I haven't read a single one of them uh, at our clinic we were we would be very happy to have you doing treatments with us uh, you can call or write us in english french german italian spanish Dutch, or obviously portuguese which is our preferred language but we thought we have native speakers for all of the other languages uh, aside from english actually um, but um, so we're very happy to help you and to assist you with their project and obviously to discuss the benefits and how and the uh, things work in Portugal. Excellent. Thank you so much for a very you, interesting Caroline. 
very informative uh, presentation and of course for the all the uh, details you provided definitely interesting what i i think uh, you have mentioned in our previous webinar is that uh, that anonymous option when the child is able to find out when turns 18 it's that it gives those children options yes they can choose whether they can they want to find out or or simply not and as you said maybe in the future they can change their mind so this is definitely yeah. interesting thank you so much and yes as you saw there are plenty of questions ready it's very interesting ones for okay. sure so thank you already for your questions we will go ahead with them right now so the first question is right here I appreciate the fact that you were non-anonymous. When I started the egg and sperm donation process, I was very surprised that most countries prohibit it. I wonder why. Uh, well, it is. Uh, it's it's also a cultural thing. Um, I don't know. Well, I, I can talk for other countries. In Portugal, it is. Uh, it is. It has always been allowed since we had this IVF legislation in the first place. But obviously, it it is related to a more conservative view of the society. We all know that in some religions, uh, donations uh, are not well seen, um, and obviously, we uh, even we ha we always have extremist groups that are anti even anti ivf anti ivf and so um we have uh, people uh, we, who are again for example the the catholic uh, religion uh, in some some members of the some more extremist vision of of the catholic religion are against uh, donation uh, in the muslim uh, religion some of them we have the well, I don't know the words in English, but uh, a part of the um, of the Muslims are in favor of the donation and authorize it, but some other part they they are against it. And so Judaism also allows uh, donation, but in certain circumstances. So uh, religion and conservative values have always been. Uh, essentially against donation okay um, and that happens with all religions uh, in in many countries and so sometimes it is more about the weight that those more conservative uh, views of the society have in terms of uh, government in terms of lawmaking the kind of influence that they have uh, that uh, make that that end up giving these circumstances there are, there is also um, the historical background uh, of the country um, but uh, i mean for example the first countries who authorized open donations were sweden and the uk which are known for having a very liberal and open view of the society and their habits and obviously we know that some other countries are, tend to be more conservative uh, so i believe that the tendency worldwide like in other things uh, is to is for the more liberal views of society to take place and this is one of the advantages of globalization because we tend to see uh, to think of the others because for some families this is the only way that they can uh, have kids and so um there is um, no alternative to the donation the alternative is not have kids okay uh, obviously mm -hmm. adoption is also an option but uh, it's uh, always different than having a, a child of your own so um uh, that's that's my explanation i think it has to be yeah. with the conservative values all right perfect thank you so much for answering that yeah. very first question definitely interesting as well and when we are talking about uh, the countries like do you think the non-anonymity will extend towards other countries like greece well um i actually don't know uh, very well the political situation in other countries but i believe that in 10 years from now everywhere in europe the donation will be non-anonymous because uh, it's pointless to keep it anonymous. Uh, it will just bring a lot of suffering uh, and to to the children that are born from anonymous donations, and also to the parents of those children 
because uh, we can't help uh, the disclosure of the identity. If let's say someone decides not to share with their kids that they are born from a, an anonymous from a donation, if that if that child later in life decides just out of curiosity, just to get to know his origins, to send his a DNA swap uh, to one of these data, data centers, he could find out that he has like 10 cousins uh, in many different countries. And so uh, here the secret, there's no, no more secret, okay? So it's preferable that they have access to the truth in a controlled way than to, to have the risk of finding it by accidents, because the, that will bring feelings of um, uh, it, 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 uh, lack of trust to their parents. Um, it's like almost like a treason. Uh, okay, so um, I don't. Uh, I think Greece and every other country will move into non-anonymity. I don't know when, but I I know that. Uh, I, I don't know if it will take 10 years or 20, but uh, it will certainly, it's an irreversible way, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that explanation once again. And yeah, definitely interesting for sure. And so I live in Spain at the moment, although I am not Spanish. Here, sperm donation is confidential, which does concern me as we can't cross borders right now. Is there any way to use a clinic or sperm in Portugal? Well, uh, first of all, um, we can you can cross borders with a declaration that you are doing treatment um, uh, that you are crossing it for health reasons. We re we have received uh, already some Spanish patients after we we reopened the clinics and we resumed our normal activity. Uh, we have um, we all since the, this change in legislation, we received a lot of patients from Spain. So they are traveling by car because there are no flights at the moment. But at the border, they show a declaration from our clinic stating that they have a treatment scheduled uh, with us and, and they are allowed to pass. Um, so um, this person, L, you just have to send us an email and we will walk you through the process. It's actually very easy. You can start treatment in Spain and leave the last part to be done here in Portugal. However, in Spain, uh, according to the current legislation, you cannot use uh, an unanimous donor. Of course. Thank you so much okay. once again. And there's another question, of course, right here. You were referring to the European human rights law that allowed the non-anonymity of sperm and donors donation. Can you please tell us which specific law do you refer to? Do you think this could be lobbied in other UR, EU, EU sorry, countries? If the laws will be adopted in other countries later, do you think the identity could be revealed uh, retroactively? Well, these are a lot of questions. So, yes. uh, first of all, um, I actually, um, th there is um, a ruling from the European Court of Human Rights against the non-anonymity, uh, against the anonymity of donors. So in favor of non-anonymity. Uh, I actually don't have any reference right here with me, but if you Google it, it's very easy to find. Uh, also, that declaration that I've shown in my presentation is from the European Parliament. Okay, so um, it's also online. Um, maybe when this video is uh, is shared by by myivfanswers.com, you can take a, another look, or you can just email me, and I will uh, be very happy to send you the article by email. Uh, and maybe then I can also send you the information of the European Court of human rights. Um, so do I think this could be lobbied in other countries? Certainly, because it's already being done by the European Commission, uh, by the European Parliament, sorry. Uh, there is a lot of pressure over all countries uh, to adopt this kind of legislation. Uh, and so uh, obviously the more the pressure, uh, the better, because I think uh, everyone should move into this kind of legislation. Um, I don't think on the other hand, that the identity of the donors could be revealed retroactively because we would be violating the donors' rights. Uh, here in Portugal, that possibility was in place, uh, was, uh, 
that situation was discussed as a possibility and uh, luckily the parliament ruled against it and they said that donors who have donated before the the constitutional court decision would still remain anonymous and the, the new donors will be non-anonymous because uh, we have to balance also the rights of those persons who very generously donated their cells to help other people um, forming their families and they were not supposed to reveal their identity uh, it's uh, it, it wouldn't be ethical to break to change the rules uh, at the end of the game you see so uh, i believe that uh, and in fact the european parliament's declaration says the same uh, it shouldn't be retroactive it should be only from that moment on but again, as I said, I, I don't think there would be any difficulty to find the, the, the identity of those anonymous donors with the current, uh, we don't even have to wait 10 or 20 or years in the future because it is already possible right now. All right, excellent. Once again, thank you so much for providing all the details. And uh, well, another question is coming up here. So. This is interesting as well. Do you also treat cases of embryo who are leftovers of other couples? I have heard that Spain and the US do it a lot and it is called embryo adoption because there are many embryos frozen and not used anymore. These embryos may come from couples who did IVF and just produced more embryos than what is needed. Will the info about these couple also reviewed? Um, well, uh, again, <laughs> several questions. Uh, first question, yes, we do uh, have embryo adoption in Portugal um, and, uh, and we have uh, a lot of embryos available for adoption. Unfortunately, uh, there is some bureaucracy associated with the adoption process, but we do have embryos available for adoptions. However, um, regarding the last part of the question, will the infos about these people be revealed? Um, it will depend because right here in Portugal, an embryo can only be donated after it, it stays at least three years frozen. So this means that today we are in May 2020, the, the most recent embryos available to be for donation have been donated in May 2017. So this was before the non-anonymity law. So uh, these embryos were donated in conditions of anonymity. If the parents, uh, the, if the father and the mother uh, of those embryos have agreed to be non-anonymous, uh, they can be donated in non-anonymous conditions. If they didn't agree to be non-anonymous, the only way that they, these embryos can be used is in a non-anonymous way. Uh, in once we get to 2021, we will have the first non-anonymous donated embryos. Uh, I hope, <laughs> and um, we will have because we already have some papers signed. And so um, all of those embryos will be uh, the access to the identity of uh, the progenitors of those embryos will be granted by law, obviously. Excellent. Thank you so much again for yeah. clarifying this. OK, we have more questions coming up. So let me uh, show. So is your clinic private or public? Private. <laughs> Okay, just a short question <laughs> it's easy. for clarifying. And also there's another one about the donors. Do you have Christian donors? Uh, yes, of course. Here in Portugal, like 90% or even more of the population is Christian and Catholic. Uh, and so um, almost all of our donors are Christians. Um, we don't make any... Uh, I mean, that's not a factor while selecting the donor, usually. Um, we just, we don't ask people about their religion. Uh, but, um, I mean, it's just common statistics. Uh, we have uh, donors, uh, I mean, we, are, we live in a country where more than 90% of the population is Christian. So it would be impossible not to have Christian donors. Of course, thank you once again for clarifying that. I can see that uh, someone asked uh, to be contacted. Thank you for providing your email address. And, yeah. uh, yes, that's uh, 
really, really good. Happy to hear that. And is the cost of non-anonymity, is, is it different than for anonymous? For example, if you purchase sperm from the Danish sperm bank, the prices are different. Uh, well, uh, here in Portugal, all donors are non-anonymous. So we we have uh, we are authorized to use anonymous donors from before the change in the legislation. So we have a few, um, but uh, we don't make any distinction. Uh, it's the same. Well, at least at Fertility Central, our clinic, we only uh, the cost of using a, an anonymous uh, a non-anonymous sperm donor is the same of using an anonymous one. It's always four hundred and fifty euros, uh, and and there is no difference in costs. Okay, uh, we also so using a donor sperm here. All, well, at least at Fertility Central and Procrear, uh, we costs always the same. So we don't make any distinct, distinction between the two types of donors. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And for now, at least it seems that this is going to be our last question. However, if you have any left, I definitely encourage you to type those in in the chat section so mm. that uh, Dr. Vladimir can help you out. And the question is, so does your clinic help single women and to what age? Uh, of course, we help single women, also women's couples. We do uh, shared motherhood and the Ropa method as well. So um, we here in Portugal, we can treat uh, women's, uh, women with a, with a male partner, women, single women, and also um, uh, lesbian couples uh, we we are allowed to treat women until the age uh, of 50 uh, excluding 50 which means 49 years and 364 days so um, there's um, uh, again it is a very liberal legislation and, and very inclusive as well Excellent. Thank you so much again for answering that question. At least for now, I do not see any other uh, questions. So I just want to make sure that you have asked all of your questions. If not, just go ahead and type it in as it is like a final call for those questions. And uh, well, already I would like to thank Dr. Vladimiro for joining us tonight, for supporting our initiative. It's always a pleasure to have you with us here. And well, I know there is another uh, upcoming uh, webinar in June, 24th of June. We have another topic to discuss. So I'm very excited to hear that uh, you will be back with us. Right. Thank you, thank you, Caroline. Uh, it was really fun. Uh, I'm, it's it's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, I love these webinars. I was telling you before we got live that uh, this is a fantastic initiative from your website. Uh, I think this is really supportive because in a lot of places uh, people uh, are still not uh, able to start their IVF treatment. Uh, their lives are on hold because of all of this coronavirus situation. Um, I've seen just a, a few questions here. I will give quick answers. Uh, yes. If you need to ask me something else, just send me an email. There's absolutely no problem. I'm very happy to share more details on the information that I've that I've presented here. Uh, also, the ethnicity of our donors. We have all kinds of donors. We don't have discriminations. Uh, obviously, we need. Uh, we have more uh, Mediterranean style donors. Let's good, but we also have black and Asian and blonde donors. So. Uh, we have, uh, like I said, for in the case of egg donors, we have more than 2,000 registered egg donors. So uh, it's quite a lot of people. Um, so, but again, Caroline, it was a, a, pl a pleasure to be here. I have to congratulate you for this fantastic initiative. And so, um, thank Happy you. To to do it always so really uh, it's it's really nice to cooperate with you and in the meantime if you could take a look there's another question uh, Just okay. the, well um we don't share photos of the donors uh, we obviously we can work with donors from the danish sperm banks as long as they are non-anonymous but uh, here in portugal we we I mean, I don't know if the other clinics are doing it, but at least at Fertility Center and Procrear, we're not sharing photos of the donors. We just give information uh, on their phenotype and blood type. Uh, and also we can disclose some 
non, some other non-identifying donors. It is very important for us that the people receiving, the person who is receiving the donation somehow relates to the donor. Obviously, sometimes we get all kinds of questions about the donors, like uh, are they left-handed? Do they sing? Uh, do they like rock music? I mean, uh, sometimes we can uh, give that information. We know that mm, those are not genetic uh, issues, but people need to feel a connection to the donor so they can feel right about the donation. And obviously, as long as it is non-anonymous information, non information that doesn't disclose the donor's ID uh, that we can share uh, at the moment, and because sometimes we don't know the answer for those questions, uh, but we we can talk to to the patients about the donors and 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 give them some some non uh, let's say non phenotypic information about them but as but we have to keep their identity confidential because it can only be revealed to the person born from the donation and when he or she reaches the age of 18 excellent once again, huge thank you for answering this question as well. And it, we will be finishing for tonight. So thank you all of you for joining us again for your questions. And of course, just let me remind that uh, this has been recorded. Therefore, you will have a chance to watch this again. You will find it on myivfanses.com. And if you simply subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Facebook or Instagram, you will be updated when the new video is uploaded, but also you will uh, be able able to see when new event is uh, is actually approaching as you know we have plenty more events coming up even this week there are like eight events left so uh, stay tuned with us uh, we will be back here tomorrow at 6 p.m uk time but also at 8 p.m uk time so i do hope you will be able to join us and to well simply get to know and find out a bit more on other uh, topics there are plenty more topics to come as well once more, Dr. Vladimiro, thank you so much. Have a lovely thank evening. Thank you, Caroline. And you too. Take care. Till the next time. Till the next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.